Which early running back performances do we believe in and which ones are going to change? That's what we're talking about today on Stealing Bananas. I'm Ben Gretsch. You can find the Stealing Signals newsletter at bengretsch.substack.com. With me, as always, is Sean Siegel. You can find all of his great work over at Rotoviz. Sean, in one of my previews this week over at Stealing Signals, I did a little digging in the Rotoviz screener, which is a great research tool for anyone who isn't using that to cure query curie uh the, the like past databases and things so i i set it to the first three weeks of last year fantasy scoring you know a couple basic stats and looked at where we were at this point last season and then compared it to where we finished in a lot of cases and there was some wild stuff i mentioned some some receivers some quarterback stuff some things that shifted some that you probably remember, stuff like Justin Fields starting slow and then coming on big. Um, stuff that, you know, I maybe had forgotten a little bit. The position that was the most striking was running back, and we know that to be the case. Generally, I didn't want to make that whole point just be about running backs, but James Robinson was the PPR running back three. Clyde edwards Elaire was the RB4. DeAndre Swift was the RB5. Cordero Patterson was the RB7. None of those four guys who were in the top seven through three games last year finished in the top 20 of running back points despite getting out to those sizable early leads. They None of them also finished as the top scoring running back on their own teams. They were all passed. James Robinson ends up getting traded. Obviously, gets passed by ETN. Clyde edwards Elaire gets passed by McKinnon, I think, was the top scoring Chiefs back by the end of the year. DeAndre Swift by, obviously, Jamal Williams has all those touchdowns. And Cordero Patterson gets passed by Tyler Algier by the end of the season. You also had a lot of players that found, that found themselves in the top eight towards the end had been off to slow starts. And I think there's a decent case that as these offenses are trying to figure out who they are early in the year, that these first three weeks are probably the ones that matter the least. For Josh Jacobs, 8.3 points, 9.1 points, 14.7 in his first three games. Weeks four to six, he had three straight 30-point games. He would eventually finish as the RB3. Austin Eckler, 11.2, 18.4, 13.3 in his first three games. These are all PPR totals. Those are solid numbers, but none of them hit 20. He would then rattle off five straight games of 24-plus PPR points, eventually finishes the RB1. Derrick Henry had started with 8.2 and 8.5 in his first two games, and then he hits a 25.3 game in Week 3. Weeks 1 and 2 would end up being his lowest scores until he had another down game in Week 13. He'd eventually finish as the RB4. You have Ramondre Stevenson started with 4.7 and 6.1. This is a guy whose role wasn't really certain. He had 20.1 in week three. He wouldn't score single digits again until week 14, kind of similar to Henry. Once he hit that role, he stuck in that role. Tony Pollard had three straight games under 20 points. Uh, his highest was 19.8 in, in week two in the early part of the season, but 4.2 in week one, 10.5 in week three. He had a 1.8 in week four. He wouldn't have his first major eruption until week eight. But then at that point, for the next six weeks, he had five 20-plus PPR games out of those six games. So when he finally got to the point where he hit a 20-plus point game, it stuck. He actually had 30 points in week eight, and then it stuck for the next six weeks where he was consistently rattling off 20-plus point games. There's a lot of these examples. You, you can dig into this. You can kind of – do this all day. Uh, Jonathan Taylor is another one I mentioned. He was RB10 in scoring at this point after three weeks, which was a little bit of a concern for fantasy managers who had taken him in the top two picks overall in almost every league. And it actually didn't turn around. You know, we were, I, I think, probably at that point talking about him turning it around. He had already logged his best single game performance of the season in week one. He had 27.5 points, but he was only sitting at RB10 through week three. The concerns about the offense, about Matt Ryan and everything in Indianapolis just got worse. And Taylor also had you know some injury issues. I also mentioned Joe Mixon. He had been uh, a major buy low for a lot of people on his workload at that point. He had a 21.5 point game in week one, 11.3, 6.8 the next two weeks. He wouldn't hit 20 points again in any other game from week four through the end of the regular season other than that one eruption game where he had the 55-point game. So that's a little bit of a questionable one. He did score 55 points in one game, but that inefficiency did sort of plague him other than that one that one game throughout the rest of the season. He was already being called a by low at this point. 
but had already also logged one of only two 20 point games for him for the season. That was already in the bank at the week four mark. So some of these guys were showing some concerns that didn't turn around. Some of the other stuff did turn around. There's a lot of trends from last year that were already showing after three weeks. I mentioned, you know, like people were concerned about Kyle Pitts. That ended up being a concern, right? People were concerned about Sky Moore not getting on the field as a rookie in Kansas City that we're all hyped on. He didn't get on the field for most of the whole season, right? The Eagles were already showing that they were a great offense. Jalen Hurts was already hitting. That continued throughout the rest of the season. So there were, I'm not saying everything is noise right now, but it's, it's, and, and I apologize to the listeners who didn't think that was great radio to sit and just list off a bunch of point totals really quickly. But no, I mean, it, I think that gives uh, some important context. I mean, right. You just have the overall, then, I mean, it doesn't hit you in quite the same way. So I, I mean, I like that. Yeah. I just think that is, like you said, good context. It's a good grounding reminder that the things that we've seen through three weeks, if last year's any indication, they're not certain to continue. And it feels like they are certain to continue. Now is a moment in time where, you know, after the first game, everyone's like, ah, what, what's real? What's not real? After the second game, you're like, well, we have two data points, but we still only have two data points. You start to get to three, four. This is when people start to get, I think, too certain because they've seen it for a couple of times now. And it's sort of the weekly nature of the NFL, which we've talked about before, where you question something all week. And then if you get it reinforced on Sunday, you know, there's that 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 time period of thinking through, well, is, is this real? And then it happens again for a second point, And then you're like, oh, it's definitely real. I can't question that anymore. And if you do that for three weeks, it feels really real even though all the examples I just gave are great examples of situations well, one where game, three weeks. I mean, can feel so definitive. I mean, just look at some of the main events where, I mean, Devin Achan was one of our favorite guys, somebody I wrote up very glowingly and, you know, kind of joked that it was like way over the top what I was writing about him in the zero RB candidates countdown. And yet, I mean, I lost multiple main events last week because his 50 points were on the bench. I mean, if you could see the future, then obviously those points would be in the lineup. And at the same time, it happens once and you're like, well, this now I mean, you should definitely be taking that heavily into consideration. And I do want to again mention, I mean, the interesting things here with efficiency. This isn't going to be a show directly about that, right? We've We've gone over that element in the past weeks and then we went over it again on Sunday night. But... One of the things, Ben, that I was pulling up here because it does matter for our thesis on some of the individual backfields is I I pulled up the team level expected points for the running back position this week. And there are some offenses creating more than I expected. There are some offenses creating far less, like the New York Jets, for example. That part, not a surprise because you have the quarterback injury, which changes everything for them. But one of the funny things for people who want to sell efficiency (laughs) is that right now, the Miami Dolphins, and this isn't going to come as a shock to people. Everybody just watched that game. But the Miami Dolphins have more fantasy points over expectation at the running back position than all but six teams have expected points. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, I mean, you do That's want insane. some long scores and some and some touchdowns in there. This isn't going to be the last time that we see individual week explosions from players who then you know it changes our mind about how the season looks. I mean, all you have to do is look at that Saints game and think, you know, what if Derek Carr doesn't get hurt? What if Kendra Miller breaks a run? Which, I mean, he actually looked pretty good for a final stat line that's terrible. And that would really change how people see that. I mean, some of my high-stakes leagues, he was even dropped. I mean, if he breaks a play in that game and the Saints go on to win as opposed to losing their quarterback and losing, very different situation now. One of the things interesting about that as we get Alvin Kamara coming back, and it's certainly going to change how the Saints function and the outlook there, the Saints are dead last in expected points to the running back position through three weeks. That is wild. So, yeah, we wanted to talk about – you have been working on some running back research. you got a great piece coming out. It is not published as of this recording, and so we were talking about it a little bit before the show. I – have not read it or seen it, but I'm very excited to, but, you know, we thought this would just be a fun thing to dive into a little bit. Some of these backfields, like you just laid out where 
some of what we've seen through three weeks, we don't necessarily believe is going to be indicative. The way you put it to me a little bit in you know the pre-show as we were talking was some of the stuff that we've been wrong on. What's the stuff that we think that we're scared that we're wrong on that it's going to you know it could actually hurt us? And what's the stuff that we just think as it plays out? we'll work back towards our preseason expectations in some regards. We're going to have different opinions on these things. Uh, in some cases, a lot of it's going to be dependent on just having watched the games, having watched the offenses, having expected certain things and seen other things or seen things that are in line with expectation and seen some sort of just unfortunate, you know, sort of bad luck or, or what have you in the first couple of games. There's a lot of ways things can play out. One of the other things I talked about in that introduction as I used those examples was that it's crazy to me every year we get back to this point where people get so confident in the first couple of weeks as a response to being so wrong about so much stuff in August. And so like what I wrote was like, I don't understand how we're here every year. The response to how wrong everyone was about stuff in August is to think that the stuff in weeks one to three is now gospel instead of recognizing that we're going to be wrong again. And we're going to. So, Sean, we're going to talk through what we think might happen. But the point is, we were wrong about stuff in August. That's the lesson learned. And we're going to be wrong about stuff we talk about on the show going forward as well. You still try, obviously, to, to um, identify the situations that are exploitable. One of the things you do, I mentioned also in this write-up, I'm trying to do two things, to be wrong less than others, but also to emphasize the impact of the decisions that we're making so that when we are right, the payoff is adequate to justify the risk that we've taken on in these bets. In a lot of cases, we're trying to find bets that are cheap, that are easy to make, that are the cheap waiver wire ads, or maybe potential trade candidates that are undervalued or what have you. But the point is understanding that you're not going, like don't be too certain about anything. And so we're going to talk through these backfields. There's a lot um, that are interesting around the league. And, and as I just laid out at the, at the start of the show, there's a lot that's going to happen if 2022 is any indication. There was a lot of shifting from this point forward last year. There is. And one of the interesting elements is this interplay between the evidence and the psychology. And then one of the things that the fantasy douche made as, you know, really the tagline or the big selling point, the over arching theme for Rotoviz when he started it was this evidence-based mindset. Obviously, that's something that is very important to you and all the work that you do. And so when we're working through the stuff in the off-season and we're taking contrarian perspectives in certain spots, the contrarian perspectives are underpinned by the evidence both from a macro perspective, what the trends are, how do these individual profiles you know, move through time, and then also on the individual player level where we know that that person's performance is probably going to bounce around quite a bit. And so you have to work through and try and see the bigger picture as well, even for individuals. But there's an evidence basis for it. It's not a matter of saying, you know, I prefer it to be this way or this is just a random opinion. The element there, though, that is difficult is that even within that, psychology for individual analysts and managers is going to come into play. And one of the things that I have you know, tried to tell people over time is that especially if you're going to bet against certain types of workload and you're going to bet in favor of talent, if you're going to play a, a more pure zero RB approach, and then that wasn't necessarily what we were recommending for 2023, but you need to be patient and you need to be especially willing to be wrong in the first month because that's the time period where you're the most likely to be wrong because the way that you get ADP in the first place and the way that you get a vague consensus on these players is that the tea leaves do point in the direction of individual starters on teams getting the workload early, right? Early. So, so a workload-based perspective is going to be more likely to work out for those managers who are taking that as the foundation is more likely to be correct early. So 
one of the things that I'm looking through here, and you can even just look at the you know, huge difference with Miami, the first two weeks and the third week. One of the notes that I had the previous week about the rest of season rankings was that even with HN and Wilson not available, that Mostert's EP had been pretty low. Now he had done well, he'd scored well. So you were enthusiastic about that, but you had to worry about <laughs> what was going to happen as the season developed. And then you get this game where one of the things that can be easily lost is that Mostert had far and away his highest individual game EP in a <laughs> game where his running mate, you know, goes over 200 rushing yards, scores two receiving touchdowns, all of that. So again, we know that that isn't sustainable. It's the question of like, how big is the pie going to be knowing that it's not going to be that big, but you get through two weeks. And like you said, the evidence would appear to point in a certain direction. You get another week, you get another week. It's going to change some of these things, but it is interesting then I think. And one of the things that I feel like I certainly have to answer for is if there are situations where I've recommended an early-ish back and that player is performing poorly, there's a different standard there than someone I've recommended in rounds 11, 12, 13, 14, what have you, because there is a greater expectation that that player gets off to a fast start when you're spending up to get him. So we're, we're looking at so many different types of things here as we work through the running back position. But I do think that all of those elements come into play. And again, the psychological element of how much does it hurt you when you were wrong, especially at the beginning? How resilient are you? How able are you to maintain hope on the players where you knew that hope, and again, hope that's <laughs> underpinned by the evidence that hope is justified, but how able are you to keep that feeling going so that as a fantasy manager, your tactics all point in the same direction? Because the problem that you can really get into is if you take a talent-based, efficiency-based, but contingency-based approach to your draft, and then three weeks in, you're like, I can't take it because I've hit on some negative things. I'm going in a different direction. I don't think that you can do that very effectively. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't change course on certain individual players, but you need to know going in that you're going to be able to continue to point in the direction of an internally consistent roster. So that's something that we also will be looking at here. But but I think that you know managing your emotions and managing the psychology is important to making good choices and to doing good analysis after week three. Because if you feel like the players that you have technically or theoretically or just you know very clearly missed on through three weeks, that you then have to chase that, you're not going to be in a good position to accurately gauge what's most likely to happen going forward as opposed to simply saying, well, what happened last week is, is what I've got to go with. I think that's all really well put. What backfield should we start with? Well, a couple of teams that are interesting, or at least one backfield that I think is interesting, and we don't necessarily have to spend a lot of time on it because I don't know that there's that much we can necessarily take from it, but – the Kansas City Chiefs, with their very mediocre backs, that's an interesting backfield after all three of them score in double figures in week three. Now, part of that happens because the Chiefs get the 41-0 lead on a terrible Chicago team. Blair had some fantastic notes in his write-up the previous week where only one team allows more FPO per game to opposing rushing tax. Only two allow a higher evasion rate. I mean, if you're Isaiah Pacheco, if you're Clyde Edwards Alaire, and you want to look decent in a game, that game is most likely to be a game against the Chicago Bears. But Kansas City is creating some value here. They have 42 total EP in this game, which again, to put that in context, the Saints are just under 48 for the whole season. Right? So you have these you have this pie that is maybe larger than expected because the chiefs notoriously are a team that is very pass heavy is going to be pass heavy, even in some theoretical run scripts. You have a situation here where Pacheco is averaging 5.2 receiving expected points per game. 
Now, I wouldn't necessarily expect that to continue, and that's not a number that gets him into the RB1 conversation by any stretch, but it is a number that makes him very viable at the draft cost. You have a game where Jarrett McKinnon scores a couple of receiving touchdowns. You have Clyde edwards alaire more involved as a runner and as a route stealer. I mean, not that he's doing a ton, but you get 15 carries and seven routes for him in this game as really the third wheel and for pacheco he still doesn't look good but he is fast and his evasion rate again in a small sample the evasion rate stuff is going to really bounce around when you're looking at just you know two three games but it's from 10 percent to 20 percent. and so it, based on what he's done in the first three games it's harder to make the claim that he is a pure zero but again this is a game where even though he has an excellent overall performance he's at minus six FPOE for the game. Again, indicating that probably if you had a legitimate starter in there, that I mean that Kansas City number one back would be a fantasy gold mine. Instead, <laughs> we've got this mess. Is there anything that jumps out to you about how you would play it either going forward or if you think that Pacheco is going to be a guy who ends up with more value than at least you and I were assigning to him previously? And I guess my final question on it would be kind of from a demoralized fan perspective does this decent start like completely close the door on them actually going out and acquiring someone decent i mean we're into the I, season if they were going to acquire someone decent you probably would have expected it <clears throat> earlier but i still feel like you know you have chris jones in you could now re-sign him to something bigger at least that would be my understanding where you know you manage his salary cap hit through assigning bonus but is, is it it's it's zero percent chance that they acquire jonathan taylor isn't it it's not far away from zero percent i think i think you said it well when you said that the sort of regardless of how the success has come the the i mean they, they've gotten and it's interesting they're kind of keeping mckinnon tucked away for now at least that's been my read on it he didn't play much here snap share was even below Clyde Edwards Alaire obviously it ends up being a blowout and Clyde Edwards Alaire plays but he, besides the two touchdown receptions I think he only had five total touches in the entire game so like they they use him in the high leverage spots which they have and you can get the TDs but you're not getting a lot of yards on those those are short touchdown receptions and then he gets three other touches in the entire game so I mean that's that's a hard start obviously in fantasy you are it's basically a touchdown or bust type play the pacheco question is an interesting one he had five green zone touches only converts one gets the one touchdown um he also got a target in close i mean he got a lot of work in close and it is i mean i think it's a fair question of like especially with a negative six fpoe you referenced i mean i think that's a lot of that was just in the really high leverage plays he otherwise, I think, looked okay, and they're using him quite a bit. I mean, his his routes being up above McKinnon's was kind of notable to me, and the fact that he had seven high-value touches overall, kind of notable to me. So I think, like you said, at his draft cost, he can be a useful piece, but I'm not really um, in on his ceiling in this three-headed backfield. I mean, I think you put it pretty well it's it's kind of jumbled and it's sort of just a thing where the fact that Clyde Edwards Zillaire can play 30 percent of the snaps he played a decent amount back in week one as well he was the starter in, in the week one game they didn't actually play him a ton as that game was close later but he's been involved throughout three weeks and it has made it a three a three-headed backfield there's a lot of backfields that are already consolidated to two in the NFL. And and so, yes, I mean, the chiefs are a great offense to have the lead back for. And so Pacheco can probably have some good scoring at the same time, that this three headed mess. And it's, it's the way that I always talk about the committees is in regards to those high value touches, which is why I'm kind of emphasizing that. And Edwards, Allaire does end up scoring a short touchdown and get a green zone touch. McKinnon scores two touchdowns. Pacheco does as well. They score four TDs, which I joked in stealing signals is called half of a Miami game. Um, but the, all three of the backs find their way into the end zone. Pacheco does dominate the green zone touches, but 
when I talk about committees, like I think there's a big difference between a committee where one back is getting all of the high value touches and he's seeding work on low value touches. I don't think of that as as much of a committee and the expected points will show that. That's why, you know, that's how you love to use the EP and the FPOE. This is one where the high value touches are split a little bit and, and CEH's TD was, um, Early in the game, it was in, in the second quarter. It was their first, uh, their, their first rushing touchdown, their second touchdown of the game. McKinnon's TDs were their first and third TDs. Their first three TDs were McKinnon, Ceh, McKinnon, and then Pacheco scores later. Actually, so this wasn't because it was a blowout. Ceh got a late touchdown. They used the other backs in close, and so when you when you start to get the high value touches split, that's a true committee to me in a lot of regards. I think there's some positives to Pacheco's role. I also think there's some real issues with the split where, you know, you might need an injury to one of the other two for him to consolidate more work to be hitting a real ceiling. Another back that we talked about, Sean, in the pre-show, that for me, I guess I would say, I'm, well, I'm, I'm concerned about the efficiency side. So when we, we're, we're talking about a couple of different things, the workloads, but also how they've looked and haven't loved the way he's looked, but in terms of his split, he's a great example of the of the high value touch thing I just said, where he's been in a bit of a committee. Talk about Ramondre Stevenson. He's been in a bit of a committee, but he's dominated the high value touches for the most part. And so for me, it's like, okay, fine. Like let Zeke take some of the low value touches. The routes have been really high, in particular. I mean, Zeke has had some catches, but Ramondre Stevenson ran routes on seventy percent of dropbacks this week. Uh, uh, Ezekiel Elliott was at twenty seven percent. That's been pretty consistent over three weeks where Stevenson's been substantially higher in routes. It's not like they're split. We're just talking about the Chiefs. Last week it was, I think, 35, 32, 20 for the three backs in terms of routes per drop back. So what we're talking about in New England, a 70% route share, that's a big number for our running back. Weeks one and two, he was at 58 and 57%. So it actually went up. Zeke has not hit a 30% route share yet. So it's not like he's cutting into the routes. He's cutting into the targets and those things. But Stevenson's been very inefficient as a runner, has not made explosive plays. The last couple of years, he has looked good in the advanced stats as a runner. This year so far, not so much. No, he hasn't. And in the last couple of seasons, as you mentioned, he was one of just a handful of backs to go over three yards after contact per attempt in both years. And in both years, he has a good ability to evade tackles. Last year, he comes in, you know, number three overall in running back receptions. And so when I'm looking at, you know, what's the type of profile I would pay up for, that's it, right? And you look at Stevenson, obviously he was drafted much lower last year. So it's an apples and oranges from a draft cost perspective. But even when you're drafted lower to be, I mean, he was a top 10 guy in terms of advance rate, semifinal advance rate, finals advance rate last season. We know that he has the potential to score points in bunches and be an impact type of player. So then you're going back to, well, what are the underlying elements through three weeks and just how bad has it been? One of the things when you look at this is that he had a game in week one where he probably wasn't 100% health-wise. He'd been ill that, that week leading up to the game. They've already played two games in the rain. They've played games against good opposing defenses. And so there are mitigating circumstances, but I don't think you completely throw everything that's happened away either, right? I mean, he's been awful as a rusher in terms of doing the main thing that you and I always talk about, which is you've got to gain yards. And he's not doing it in either portion, right? I mean, you're at 1.1 before contact, 1.8 after contact, when I mean, you're averaging less than three yards per carry. Now, the thing that we do want to look at here is that he's still at a 15% evasion rate that those numbers are fine. And so it would suggest that he's gotten unlucky. Now, again, I mean, you have to be explosive enough that you actually make the plays. The interesting contrast here, and this is one where it's going to depend a little bit on your perspective and how you want to see things. And I've kind of mentioned going back to the psychology of it and understanding the difference between the psychology and the evidence, Right. So when we're looking through three weeks and we're seeing different like final results than we're expecting, what do the underlying metrics tell us? And do those metrics fit with 
our take coming in that was, again, evidence-based to start with or not. So when you look at Stevenson and he's at 15%, when you look at Ezekiel Elliott and he's at 0%, right? So there are only two backs who have at least 25 carries in Sports Info Solutions through three weeks has not charted them with either a broken tackle or a forced missed tackle. Elliott is one of the two. So because we know that Stevenson over the last two years was really good and Elliott over the last two years was really bad, and now we're seeing that the underlying metrics also suggest that that's the case again, I think that we can take that as being more or less true. Now, whether or not the team sees it that way, because one of the things that that's does matter tricky. is that you can have the workload. And one of the reasons that we always say, you know, don't just buy workload is that if the player underperforms for a length of time, the workload manages. That can happen to the players you like, just like it can happen to the players that you are fading. And so we have to be concerned about that here. One of the things with Stevenson's route rate this past week is that he had four targets, which, I mean, you really would like to see him more involved when they don't have good receivers, right? But of those four targets, three were catchable. And of the three catchable targets, two were dropped. Yeah. And so, again, in both phases of the game, he's putting things on tape that Bill Belichick is not going to like. And so that would be the concern for me. I I mean, you have to buy him right now. And I think that the future is still very bright. And yet, if we were to say definitively, don't worry, he's going to bounce back, it's locked in. That is not true because he's made the kinds of mistakes through three weeks that can be problematic. And to your point, I mean, I, I one of my favorite things of everything you just said there was that as or favorite things to hear or not specifically as a hater, but because it helped me crystallize the situation was that Ezekiel Elliott has not forced any missed tackles or broken any tackles so far because he did rush 16 times for 80 yards last week, five yards a carry. He's at 4.4 for the year now. You just mentioned that Ramondre Stevenson's under three and, you know, we get the the comments about using yards per carry but like the point is the team is looking at it and saying one back is averaging one and a half yards per carry more than the other back is that something that influences now bill belichick's one of the coaches i would expect that to least influence when the underlying metrics are saying what you just said they're saying because he's so into offensive line plan those things i think he'd be very aware that like you know ezekiel elliott's Mm -hmm. runs are well blocked plays and maybe stevenson's haven't been as well blocked or what have you Having said that, Stevenson is not playing well. That was the you know a big part of what you were getting at there. He's dropping passes in the passing game. He's struggling in the rushing game, and that would it would it be surprising if he just wasn't in you know as heavily in the game plan this week and they went heavier into Ezekiel Elliott? No, I mean that would be something that Bill Belichick would do, right? Like we've seen that before, where they're just saying Ramondre Stevenson's not playing well right now. We're going to kind of set him aside for a game or a couple of games. And that's tough. To your point, he is a buy right now if you can get him discounted because his manager is also freaking out because the way that he's being used is what was so great about wanting to draft him. He caught 69 balls last year. He was in this you know type of role last year. But like you said, he only gets the four targets. He only catches one of them. Like He's not going to get to 69 targets that way. So... We would like to see him playing a little bit better. Now, to be fair, he did catch all nine of the targets that he saw in the first two games. So there's like a minor positive we can we can float. But ideally, we see a good game from him and we see it reasonably quick. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a tricky backfield as well right now. Another one you mentioned with me alongside Ramondre, the, another, another player that we really like before we get into some of the guys that we maybe weren't on as much and are having some concerns. And we want to talk through how to play that. Javante Williams is a guy that we talked about a lot and liked. One of the concerns there is sort of similar to the Kansas City situation where they are using three backs. I talked about the committees being interesting to consider not from a total touches or even snaps perspective but from a high value touches perspective 
And from a high value touches perspective, th- that's been kind of concerning for Javante. Samaje P. Ryan is running more routes. He has more high value touches so far. Williams has been seeing like more targets per route. Like they're designing some screens and some things for him in the passing game, but they're playing P. Ryan more on passing downs, especially in weeks one and two. Week three, P. Ryan's number came down a little bit, but Javante's didn't really go up. He was at 33% routes, 26% routes the first two weeks. He was at 31% the third game. P. Ryan was up at 47%, 60%, and then down at 31%, matching Javante. I think in, in week three, they were doing some more pass blocking from the running backs and those types of things. But P. Ryan is playing more in the passing situations, the third and longs, the two-minute drill, some of that stuff. When Javante's out there, like I said, they they have intentionally thrown him the ball some. But part of the, the preseason usage and some of the thoughts on Javante was he could have the potential to catch a lot of passes. That hasn't necessarily materialized. Now, maybe that expands as you know faith in his knee expands. He's gotten more rushing work by a lot. They're barely using P. Ryan in the running game. The low value touches are very dominantly towards Javante right now, but he's also not been efficient as a runner so far. He's been sub four yards per carry. I felt like I have been, and maybe this is a guy I'm seeing through rose colored glasses. I think I try to be pretty objective, even on the guys I like, but I felt like I've seen a pretty good version of Javante Williams through the first couple of games despite the efficiency not being strong. Yards per target is very low as well on, on Javante. No explosive plays really on either side. But I felt like I've seen a little bit of burst in some of those things for a guy who was coming back from a multi-ligament injury. He's already gotten 44 touches through three games. And I feel like it's just going to get stronger and the faith in the knee is going to get better. And I can see where he can be explosive down the line. That said, I mean, the actual production is not great. P. Ryan taking a lot of that work is not great. Jaleel McLaughlin w- working in at all is not great as a third running back. What have you seen from Javante? He's looked good, but the offense looks like it's going to be more of a problem than I was hoping. Having said that, I think it can evolve in a way that is very positive because one of the things – that I think has happened so far is that Russell Wilson has been more dynamic than anticipated and yet has continued to make a lot of mistakes. And when we think about what we were expecting from a Sean Payton offense and especially the rhetoric that he kind of came into the season with, I was anticipating an offense where they were looking to be a little bit more conservative with the running backs really involved in the passing game, we haven't gotten that New Orleans Saints element of it yet. And I think a lot of listeners be like, well, I mean, you can't expect that. But one of the things we talked about is that even prior to Alvin Kamara showing up and having that sort of golden couple of years there in his first couple seasons, they had been creating a ton of total expected points or just a ton of total running back value, even when they weren't that talented. And Javante Williams, more talented than those guys who were in those running back committees that generated so much value pre Camara. So when you look at it from that perspective, it's perhaps not surprising to see McLaughlin a little involved. We knew that Samaje P. Ryan was going to be involved. But when you look at the trajectory here, week one, where Williams has 16 expected points, that's what we were anticipating at least for say mid-season and on and maybe even up to like a 20 ep type of workload i mean a big workload where he's emerging as a star as he comes back from this serious injury the last two contests he's below 10 which is just completely non-viable for someone that we drafted in the round you know five six turn round six round seven and underdog type of range right you got to get more total volume than that and in Week three, it's perhaps not surprising because when you're down by like seven touchdowns, you're not going to be heavily deploying a player who is still, I don't know if he's recovering exactly, but he's within this range where you're going to be limiting him just in general. You're not going to be running him out there on plays when you don't need to use him, right? The previous week when they're up but blow this big lead to Washington and blow it quickly, 
I mean, you'd like to see him more involved in that game. You'd like to think they could control the game a little bit more with Williams. They weren't able to do that. And you look at the last couple of weeks, and Denver very quickly is going from a team where they were struggling at QB and they were making like every decision around how can we get more explosive on offense to complement this elite defense to where their defense is an absolute train wreck. And they may not be in position to c- control games. Right. I and mean, if you're going to let Sam Howell roar back on you like it's nothing, if you're going to let the Dolphins, you know, have this historic, you know, 60 year flood type of game, I mean, you may be in situations where a lot of these plays are actually going to be going to Cortland Sutton, to Jerry Judy. You're going to have Marvin Mims on the deep passes. They've used Mims as a, a carrier out of the backfield, right? There are only so many plays in the game. And if they have to be aggressive you know, targets from, Russell Wilson, then you're losing some of the value that Javante Williams brings. Now, the same kind of situation that we have with Ramondre Stevenson is the case with Javante Williams, where his yardage total is terrible, but he is doing what you would expect from a tackle evasion perspective. Broken tackles, 11%. Missed tackles, 8%. Total evasion rate, 19%. That kind of 20% rate is the elite level. And so if your yardage isn't there, but your peripherals are there and your yardage has been there in the past, then, I mean, you're probably looking again at a buy low. Now, Javante hasn't been as dominant at the NFL level at creating some of these plays. He was, you know, just an absolute superstar with the North Carolina team. His breakaway rush score, excellent from that perspective. I mean, is he going to be a guy who is more like David Montgomery, Zach Moss type of thrash around break tackles, but don't create yards at the NFL level. And in a committee, especially, is that going to cause him problems? I mean, maybe, right? I mean, you wouldn't pay these prices for David Montgomery in this offense. You wouldn't be excited about David Montgomery going forward in this offense, even though David Montgomery is a good player, right? But you need to be a great player. And I don't know if we're there with Javante Williams, but certainly still the breadcrumbs are in place. I think that if you still like this offense and if you still have confidence in Sean Payton and Russell Wilson after you know what happened with the Miami Dolphins, I, I, this one to me is really like a, a full team-based type of perspective where if you're not losing confidence in the big picture with the Denver Broncos, now, I mean, obviously they're not going to be a great reality team, But in terms of them making progress as an offense through the season, I think that you're still on board with Javante Williams. The other two guys are really just, you know, moving pieces that they're going to put in there here and there. You don't have a secondary back in this offense who's so talented that you have to worry about it really cutting into Williams in the way that matters. And and again, that was the reason for both of these plays. You're not scared of Ezekiel Elliott. You like, but you're not scared of the secondary pieces with the Broncos. But you do have to create more total value for these running backs. I think that's really well put on the on the Broncos. I, in a in a shallow home league, was staring at Pirine on my bench this week. I didn't really need to make the move, but I I think I might have put in a waiver claim to drop him, or I was a, I was definitely at least considering it. Where, to your point, I mean, it's not. This is not like a you know we like the other back more than Javante situation. It's a, the Broncos situation might not be very good. Their offense might not be very good. And you said, if you like the offense turning around, then you can like this situation. The question of whether we should like the offense turning around is a, is a pretty big one. I mean, certainly I think Sean Payton's a, a prideful guy. He's back in the league. You think he wants to be successful, but we also talked a lot this off season about how Russell Wilson's do a huge roster guarantee on the third day of the 2024 league year at the end of this season his entire 2025 salary will be guaranteed if he's still on the roster they have to make a decision whether they want to commit another i think it's 25 million to him if things are not going well if he's not playing well i think when sean payton took this job he was aware of that and he was aware that potentially they would be cutting russell wilson after the year dealing with another rebuilding year a little bit in 2024, but by 2025 being out from under the Russell Wilson contract and then having potentially something else in place. Not saying that's definitely what they're going to do, but if things go really poorly through the middle of the season, you do have to be at least conscious of the possibility that the Broncos sort of maybe not tank, but decide that they're going to 
bench Russell Wilson and make that decision in season that they're going to move on from him. Sean, we talked at the beginning of the show about the players that were smashing through three weeks last year that didn't necessarily carry it. Um, I mentioned Clyde Edwards, Alaire, Cordero Patterson, DeAndre Swift was up there. I don't have the list in front of me at the exact moment. Oh, James Robinson was the other one. Robinson, CEH, Patterson were all guys that were not drafted particularly high. CEH and Patterson last year were in that zero RB range, round eight, round nine, what have you. Robinson was a late round pick. DeAndre Swift was a high pick. Some of the guys that we talked about turning it around, I mean, Josh Jacobs was one, but Derek Henry was one we mentioned. Austin Eckler was another. Those were guys that were drafted high that hadn't necessarily jumped out of the gate and done incredibly well, but things did move back their direction after week three. I think there is at least a little bit of a trend here, what I'm saying, as some of the surprising players through three weeks didn't necessarily keep that. And then some of the guys that were high picks that struggled, I did mention like Jonathan Taylor, for example, it didn't turn around. I'm not saying every high pick's going to turn around, but there's maybe a little bit of a trend there where if you can buy low on some guys based on a, a slow start, like a Ramondre Stevenson, who were high picks and have the roles so far, I think that's a, a reasonable decision. But the question of who would be this year's players that are crushing right now and about to fall off is an interesting one. In the top 10 right now in PPR leagues, at the running back position, it includes two Miami backs now after this week. It's Raheem Mostert as the overall RB1, then McCaffrey, Kenneth Walker, Tony Pollard, Kyron Williams. There's a name of, of somebody who's come kind of out of nowhere. Devon A. Chan, as it's pronounced now, we learned. A lot of you sent me uh, Adam Schefter's tweet from Monday after on our last show. I, I noted I had no idea how to say his name. It's Devon A. Chan, we learned this week. Great timing from Adam Schefter on that report. He is RB6, B. John Robinson, James Connor, Brian Robinson, Travis Etienne. Right behind that in a, at RB11 is Jerome Ford. At RB13, you have Zach Moss. Those are some surprising names in, in the early going. Kyron Williams is an interesting one to jump into, and that's one that I know you're going to talk about a little bit in your article. We've talked about that offense being really great for a running back who's a workhorse. He plays 100% of the snaps in week three, he runs routes on, I think it was 81% of the dropbacks, but I mean, he was out there every single play. So it doesn't really matter what the specific number was. He was the only back out there. They talk after the game. Sean McVay has a comment about they, they need to get some other backs involved to, in, in a positive way. Like they, they can't just be Kyron playing every single snap. But when you start to hear those notes, it's a little bit because, you know, he isn't showing that efficiency. This is one of the concerns about him from the beginning where, you know, even though he had, he scored very well in fantasy, particularly in week two, when he had the two touchdowns, he has not been like yardage efficient. He's been 3.6 yards per carry 4.1 yards per target. Those are well, both well below average. He does have four touchdowns already. And that's part of this role being so valuable. Is he going to stick as, you know, a top 10 running back all season? We know that they like workhorses there, but if they're already talking about, you know, including other backs, who, how, how would we play this behind him? This is a, a, both a tricky and an interesting one. Because, I mean, the guy that you really want, again, is Zach Evans. And yet, he's obviously not ready. In this particular game, I think what you were sort of hoping as an Evans fan is that he's active, right? But if you're not in the game plan and you're a rookie who, for whatever reason, can't be relied upon, maybe isn't going to play special teams, what have you, then you run into a situation where Royce Freeman ends up being the guy who's active and we know that he is not a viable NFL player that part isn't positive I mean, Williams is so interesting because he's a guy I would really love to be on I think I mentioned on the previous show that I had a lot of him in Debbie because he was such a good hybrid back for Notre Dame 
the issue that you run into here is that this is a 194 pound back in terms of at least the combine testing where he runs a 46540 he's got 29th percentile explosion we don't want to make everything about athleticism but i mean it's professional sports and the athleticism is incredibly important and you think about what teams like the eagles and Dolphins are doing so successfully, and it does depend on being able to make plays when a play is there to be made. And if you are an athlete that is sub NFL level and you are a weight that is also arguably sub NFL level, then your ceiling is probably not very good, even if you bring certain skills to the table that really help, And I think that he does as a receiving back. Now you say he gets seven targets, but only two catches in the game. How good can it be? I mean, Matthew Stafford was struggling. The offense was under pressure. I mean, you're going to have a few games like that, but when I'm putting together the zero RB candidates list and a player like Williams isn't on it, it's in part because the path to full year production is so narrow so to start with you have cam makers there that part of the path or that you know hurdle that obstacle is immediately eliminated which is great but even then to hold it and to score with it is tricky especially if the rams are not that dynamic now we know that puka has been a great story obviously williams has been a great story i've been really impressed with tutu atwell and i wrote an article this offseason talking about how i mean the reason they drafted him despite the fact that he's so tiny is that he was unbelievably good at louisville right so you have a guy who unlike so many of the players that sean McVay and kyle shanahan have drafted where you're like i mean that guy should have been a seventh round pick why did you use a second or third rounder on him i mean tutu was at least really really good in college and so i think that part of it is nice to see but it's interesting how one game changes the narrative so much. And this is what you're talking about with the through three weeks element, right? Where through two weeks, you're like Puka, Tutu, Kyron, Matthew Stafford is back as the guy who can elevate an entire offense. After week three, you're like the Rams are one and two. Granted, they've played a difficult schedule. They probably are still, you know, a well above average team, but they desperately need Cooper cup. They need more explosiveness. They need, you know, other things for Matthew Stafford to go to. And, I mean, one of those things is probably an explosive player like Evans. I mean, one of the things with Ronnie Rivers and certainly with Freeman is that those guys are sort of redundant to what Williams can do. And so I guess I wouldn't expect them to take over for him. He's a little bit better version of what they are. But you think about, like, what are we really going for in terms of prices? And certainly the price on Williams was fantastic preseason. I'm not disputing that at all. But when we look at where we are now and as we're going forward, there are some guys out there in offenses that could be very explosive who have looked good in the first couple of weeks or they have some positives and the background that they bring is extremely explosive and they're basically free. I would want to go with those guys. I mean, we can talk about them in a minute, but over someone like a Williams who doesn't bring NFL athleticism and certainly then like a Joshua Kelly, who again, doesn't bring plus NFL athleticism and doesn't have a track record of success. And one of the things that can be just so tricky is that these backs who again, are more narrow moat types of players, you know, you have that big game alongside Eckler and then he's gone and Kelly can't do anything. It's this weird dynamic where if you are enough of just like a pure offensive scheme workload play, you might even prefer the starter to be there so that the starter can create the offensive efficiency to help the drives work. And then you play off of that as opposed to be there yourself and have to do it. And then they watch you play and they're like, well, actually what we're going to do is just throw the ball every play. So I mean, that would be the difference between Williams and Kelly and some of the people that were prioritizing a little bit more heavily. And when you say narrow moat players for anyone who didn't know what that reference was, you talk about like literally a, a moat around a castle and the size of it. Some of these backs have so much insulation is another word we might use to losing their role. And a narrow moat player would be an example of one who doesn't have as much insulation and can lose that pretty quickly 
Kyron Williams looked incredible after week two. He has a, a rough game in week three. They lose a close game that they could have potentially won. And he doesn't really give them a lot. Seven targets. He has a, a, at least one drop in there. Two catches for 27 yards in the passing game on seven targets. Rushes 10 times for 38 yards. And his coach is talking after the game about how they need to spell him a little bit more. It's just never it's a just, good sign. It's one week. It's immediate where it's like we need we need more explosiveness in that backfield. I saw a lot of responses on Twitter. They're like, if you thought – you know, the reason that they were trading, you know, you you were if you thought they were trading acres because they liked Kyron, you're you're crazy, basically. Um, they moved acres because of acres stuff is sort of the point. And Kyron is the guy that's there right now. And they like him a lot, I think. And they've, they've played him 100 percent of the snaps. But I was looking at him on some places where I added him off the wave wire, and I'm like, he's probably a sell right now if I could, you know, get a get a trade and get some really good value out of him from what how he's done. And he would be for me a pick for one of these guys that started in the top ten that isn't going to finish that high. I think it's really hard to envision 17 games. Now you said at the beginning it's a tricky one because, and I've said this with this role. The ways that the Rams use running backs can be really, really valuable and can elevate some questionable talent. C.J. Anderson had been cut by two teams, lands there and has that great stretch, and then doesn't really play again in the NFL. And But during that stretch, he's going for 150 rushing yards every game and two touchdowns. I mean, this is a, this can be a nice situation for running backs, certainly. When Cooper Cup comes back, assuming he's able to get back and get healthy and be out there, this passing attack is going to be really good. They've, been, they've looked great already. Stafford's look rejuvenated. They have some tackle issues and protection issues, but Stafford's looked rejuvenated. You mentioned two, two. You got Puka Nakua. If you're able to push Van Jefferson off the field and go with a Cup Nakua, two, two Atwell, three man, you know, Cup and Nakua operating in the short intermediate range, Atwell as your vertical guy, the way that Stafford's played so far and the way that McVay's dialing stuff up, that's a dangerous passing attack that's going to challenge defensive coordinators and open up a lot of running space and get some good drives in place where you can get some short touchdown runs and all of those things that are great for a running back. I mean, this is a very good situation. Kyron, if he keeps the job all year, can score for fantasy, certainly. But it's hard for me to envision the way that he played on, on Monday night. And just like you said, you can see that he like he looks shifty and he looks interesting and he's bursty. But you can see that he's not athletic enough to add. You mentioned at one point the Eagles as an example. And I've seen some people reference – great blocking on the DeAndre Swift runs. And I, my question would be like, how come the great blocking doesn't look amazing on the Kenneth Gainwell runs of all your good calls, Sean, and you have a ton. We always talk about, you want to be right for the right reasons. I want to give you a huge hat tip on this because your case on DeAndre Swift was he's so good. You called him the premier before contact runner in all of football. He's so good before contact. And it's such a perfect fit for an offense that generates a lot of before contact yardage for its running backs as well. They're going to open up these holes. Jalen Hurts is going to hold the edge defenders and it's going to make it easy for the running backs to get in inside and hit these holes. But you watch that game against Tampa Bay and DeAndre Swift hits those holes so explosively that it's emphasizing what they're doing. The, the, the holes don't have to be open for as long. The, 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 the linemen don't have to hold the blocks as long, right? The, the Hurts threat doesn't have to hold the edge guy as long when DeAndre Swift is hitting that hole and he's into the second level and into space that quick. And you can take the screenshots and say anyone could run through this hole, but the, DeAndre Swift's at that hole quicker than other running backs can get at that hole. And Gainwell, I think, is a great example. You go look at his rushing efficiency. It was nowhere near DeAndre Swift's. And that's not an accident when you watch those runs. And it's not just that DeAndre Swift's plays were blocked better. It's because he's a better before contact runner. It's a specific point that you made in the offseason. So a huge hat tip to you. And it goes back to the Kyron Williams point where you have to block better for him. You have to hold the blocks longer. The hole has to stay open longer because he can't hit it and explode through it. I mean, it's unfair to compare him to DeAndre Swift, but when you don't have as much athleticism, it's a problem. The The margins are narrower. You can't get around the edge either. There's a couple of plays you try to bounce outside where an outside linebacker just gets him, you know, gets to him and gets makes the leg tackle. You know, I'm, I'm looking at the top list here. You have Kenneth Walker and Tony Pollard right next to him. 
and Devon A. Chan right behind him. Those are guys that get around the corner on those outside linebackers. They're explosive. You see it with Kenneth Walker all the time. He gets around the corner, gets up the sideline, destroys that outside linebacker's angle. Somebody like Kyron Williams, it's, it's a little thing, but when you watch enough football, basically, I don't want to be this, you know, sort of. Uh... You have aspirations to tape grind. Yes, I know. And I, I was going to say, um, condescending is what I was trying to say. I don't want to sound condescending, like, oh, my God, I watch all these games, and so now I know. But, like, it's just one of those things that pops out to you when you watch every game all, all you know, all uh, all year, every week. You get to this point where you're like, man, some of these guys can just get around that corner and make a really nice play out of that, and other guys don't have the athleticism. You can see the athleticism mattering. So, anyway, that would be a concern for Kyron. Sean, do you – I mean, we, I don't, I don't really know how to, where to go with the Miami stuff, but we have two Miami backs in the top six of overall scoring right now. That probably doesn't continue. You, you mentioned it. The pie can't be as big as it was this week. The efficiency is something to talk about. You talked about how their, their points over expected is more than any other backfields. Uh, what was it? They're like six other backfields expected points. You can go look at their yards per play right now. 8.4 yards per play. This is for their whole offense, not just like running backs or anything. 8.4 yards per play is an absurd number. No other ba- uh, offense ahead uh, above 6.2 yards per play. So they're 2.2 yards clear of everyone else. They have more than 400 more total yards than any other offense. They've scored 39 more points than any other offense through three games. That's 13 points per game more than any other offense. Yeah, obviously scoring 70 last week is helping that, but they scored 60 in their other two games. They were averaging 30 points per game in the other two games as well. That stuff can't all continue, but it's also indicative of this offense is very explosive and these pieces can be efficient. It'll be really interesting to see what A-Chan means for Mike McDaniel's ability to scheme things. We love how he's able to just kind of get whatever he wants out of his offenses. What do you think about Brian Robinson? He lost some work in a blowout script this week. I know you've been really high on him and talked through that his workload was going to be a lot stronger than people expected. One of my big concerns about him was the pass catching. It looked in the preseason like he was definitely going to run a ton of routes and and catch a lot of balls. So far in season, even though they refuse to use Antonio Gibson on any rushes, Gibson has run quite a bit more routes, especially in week three when they got blown out. They just played Gibson exclusively. Robinson, only five targets, only three receptions. He is RB9 because he scored three touchdowns. He's been pretty good overall. Do you think that receiving work swings back for him a little bit? I mean, he's someone who's looked good as a runner. I do think that that offense is going to be just very heavily what – Sam Howell and Eric Bieniemy can do, and you know through two weeks, I things were very encouraging. One of the things that you hate about this Bills situation is, even though the Bills don't have an unreal defense, you know that the overall pressure of that team can, in terms of just like the entire game, not just their defense, but what the offense is going to do, gapping you quickly and then forcing you to play from behind. Which, if your team has trouble pass blocking and your quarterback has trouble taking sacks, the last thing you want is being gapped early. It's certainly a concern when you look ahead to week four with the Eagles, who, I mean, you would expect to blow them out. I think that what we're seeing here with Robinson and Gibson is that Robinson is going to benefit from a lot of the neutral and leading scripts, and I think say that specifically as a receiver, where you're not going to be able to get tendencies because he actually is getting work as a receiver in those contexts. I think that once you get blown out, then you're going to see games like this where Gibson, you know, just has this massive route edge. You're not going to have Robinson out running a bunch of routes when you're in pass only mode. And so, yeah. you know, we, we definitely don't want that when you're and, and again, a very, very wide range of outcomes for Washington. One spot ahead of Robinson in the current rankings James Conner, RB8, the Cardinals as a team. I mean, they're fascinating because a lot of people are going, oh, they're um, overperforming. People didn't expect them to be this good. You know, put some respect on their name. At the same time, I'm going, I'd love to pick against them. And so I go look at the lines and I'm excited to, to potentially pick against them. 
uh, as the market starts to buy into them and they play the Niners this week and they are 14 point underdogs. Like the market is not buying in. They're the same 14 point underdogs they were with the Cowboys. The only thing the market I think bought into last week is maybe that we were a little bit too confident in the Cowboys, although they are six point favorites against the Patriots this week. So I was just kind of pretending like that game with the Cowboys and the Cardinals last week just didn't happen. I think you're not getting like a, a great number to bet against the Cardinals. If you're, if you want to say this is fluky, no one really actually seems to believe it at all anyway, but James Connor is producing. He's a, a top eight overall running back. He's getting basically all of the work. I mean, as much as he can handle, he's tied for third in the NFL with in rush attempts with 51 through three games. He's had seven catches. He scored a couple of touchdowns because they have been able to score. Part of the concern was, Maybe the Cardinals can't score. Can he hang on to this role all season? And if he can't, like, this is one of those situations where, like, it feels like it's a wide remote. Like, who's who's taking it? Keontae Ingram's not doing much. They have Emery, uh, I believe it's De Mercado, De Mercado uh, is a UDFA, I'm pretty sure, that has played a little bit, caught a couple passes. But, like, they don't have a deep running back room of candidates that are going to come take James Conner's role. But the situation could also just turn so bad that it doesn't really matter that he's getting a lot of work. What do you, what do you feel about the uh, Cardinals lead back? The Arizona situation points so dramatically in different directions that that part is fascinating, right? Because we're just through three weeks. And so we know that a lot of these sort of efficiency based stats are going to be even less representative than, you know, the volume based stats. But when I'm looking at backs to target, because they really bring something to the table from a talent perspective, I'll often look at a guy who, and again, I mean, the thresholds are soft thresholds are just for you know, eyeballing and, and thinking through what the guy is doing. But when you have someone who's averaging over two yards before contact, then giving you three yards after contact, then giving you a 20% evasion rate, you're talking about someone who's actually playing extremely well. And James Conner has struggled in some of these metrics in the past. He, he hits all of those right now. We know that he's not a great athlete. We know that he's gotten older. We know that he has trouble staying healthy in part because his running style is just so physical, but he's doing those things right now. And as you mentioned, he has no backups. Keontae Ingram, not an NFL talent. Di Mercado. I was kind of looking into his profile more to try and understand like why he is on the roster. And I mean, he's not the kind of guy coming out of TCU where you would expect him to be like hanging around the NFL. Now there can be something there that I'm not aware of, but, in turn doing a little bit deeper dive just to try and make sure nothing popped out. Right. So you're looking at Connor as being somebody who is going to get all of the work and all of the work is really helpful. Even if the pie is small. Now the problem is that the pie is almost certainly going to be pretty small, even with the really good first three weeks that he has had in the surprising success that the Cardinals have had being in a couple of games and actually winning a game. They're still fourth from the bottom in total EP to the running back position. As they struggle in future games, that probably gets even worse. Connor's going to have a hard time maintaining these individual play results where he's been really good. He just he doesn't have the talent and almost almost certainly doesn't have the talent. And we like him. We're rooting for him. I hope that he continues to make some of these plays. But this is at the very top end of what he can do. And so you have the element where he's playing well and has no backups. I and mean, there's just you can't spell him if you're trying to win a game. The other guys cannot play at the NFL level. But, I mean, it's going to be almost impossible to keep this up. And if you're saying you don't believe – I was actually very impressed. I thought they looked really good against the Cowboys. They're playing extremely hard. And, you know, while we can tend to fade some of those things for professional players, and we know that in most games most NFL players are going to come out and play hard, I do think that the Cardinals are surprisingly good and they're going to be better than I expected them to be. It's not the total train wreck. And yet, as you mentioned, I mean, they are one of the weaker teams in the NFL. Yeah. I mean, it's just so, so surprising after they 
lead in both of their first two games, lose one score games, then beat the Cowboys that, it, I mean, I, I'm just going back to them being 14 point dogs this week. I know a lot of people would say, well, that's the 49ers effect, but I mean, 14 points is a lot for a team that lost by four, lost by three, and they were come from behind losses and then won by 12 against the Cowboys. I mean, on paper, this team should not be 14 point underdogs to anyone, but and you think about, you know, when would you get out on some of these players? And in a lot of cases, you know, you may be listening and think I'm not really making moves. But just if you are in a dynasty league where someone else needs points and you can move them or you're in a redraft league where you know, you're just trying to put together the best roster you can now, you do want to think about like where are the landmine games coming where someone might get 12 carries for 10 yards and then they're not tradable. Yes. I mean, this is the kind of game where you'd be looking at that. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, and then a couple interesting stashes, Sean, that you wanted to to mention before we go. Um, I had mentioned to you, I, I think Rico Dowdle is a pretty interesting name. I think he's getting scooped up in most places. And he obviously had a touchdown this week, which is kind of put a little bit of a spotlight on him. But when you talk about what Tony Pollard's doing in particular, he's at 93 High value touches per game. That's that stat I reference all the time. It's receptions plus green zone touches. Some of that is because they've had some struggles in the green zone. And so he's started to rack some up. I had someone actually make the Tony Pollard, Joe Mixon comparison to me this week. Is he this year's Joe Mixon where we talked a lot last year about the reason Joe Mixon was getting all that short work was because he was struggling. I think the big difference there is number one, Tony Pollard is a long-term efficient runner. We've seen a larger sample of that. That's not something we had seen with Mixon. Number two, Pollard already did score twice in week one and had a third touchdown in week two called back by a holding penalty. And it's such a small sample so far that I, I mean, I'm not like panicking on Pollard yet with the larger sample that we have that shows that he's an effective runner. Having said that, it does boost his high value touch numbers a little bit, but his workload has been so strong in this offense. He's at 9.3 high value touches per game among running backs who have played at least two games. So this takes Eckler out of the equation. He had a lot in his one game that he played. No other back is over six high value touches per game. Tony Pollard has a, a three plus, about a three and a half per game edge in high value touches over any other running back in the league. And you're talking about Rico Dowdle looking like the clear number two from what I can tell. Yeah, Deuce Vaughn might play more if Pollard were to miss, but it's not clear that he would play a ton. He didn't play at all in this loss to the Cardinals. They've used him when they've been up in some games so far, but they didn't really use him at all here. The other back they have, that Hunter, I think it's Lepke or something like that is how you pronounce it, is sort of more of their fullback. It does seem like Dowdle would be the guy. They have Malik Davis on their practice squad, but the fact that Malik Davis didn't even make the squad, the, like the official team, is not a great sign for him. They did end up cutting Ronald Jones after his suspension. Um, yeah, I mean, you're talking about if Pollard were to miss any time, I would expect Rico Dowdle to play a lot in a backfield that is generating a lot of high-value touches. Some of that is the Pollard effect, where they're doing stuff to get the ball to Pollard. It's something we talked about a little bit before the show, where people were really excited about Joshua Kelly for a similar reason. And as soon as Eckler's out of the offense, they just go into a really pass-heavy mode, and, and Joshua Kelly doesn't get a whole lot of high-value touches. And even the low-value touches that he's getting, he's not doing enough to help their offense. So you do got to think through, like, is this player good enough to actually fill the role and then want to give him the ball? That was looked okay, though. And so I think he's an interesting stash. You had some other good names. Well, the title one is just fascinating because that just a handful of receptions – in that game were so dynamic and you look at Pollard you mentioned some of the concerns people have it's worrying for me that in two of the three games so far his receiving EP is like 4.0 or below when he's like the true bell cow I mean you would really love to see a back who's that explosive be around seven or eight right to be four or below not what you're looking for in this week three three targets with 29 routes so the route number is extremely positive but it looks a lot like what we got with Travis Etienne last year where you're like mm -hmm. he's out there Throw in the ball, right? I mean, get that guy the ball in space. With only seven routes, they get the three targets to Dowdle. And then, I mean, this is the kind of the cool thing where obviously you're not going to get this consistently. But on these three receptions, he breaks two tackles and forces five missed tackles. So 
contrast that to Gus Edwards and Ezekiel Elliott, who purely as runners, I haven't looked at their receiving stats, but haven't been credited <laughs> with the tackle. Duddle got seven of them on three catches. And then you're like, okay, well, I mean, just how athletic is this guy? And at 214 pounds, he's a 92nd percentile explosion dude, someone who probably actually does have NFL size and athleticism and could replicate some of what Pollard does. Could be, I mean, he's not going to be the next Pollard, but when you're looking at him, and this was interesting to me, like he had his best college season back as an 18 year old freshman, like all the way back in 2016. <laughs> I mean, that's a long time ago. But he makes the Dallas roster in 2020 as under after free agent, plays special teams. I guess I didn't realize that he had missed big chunks of the last two seasons on IR. So maybe a more interesting trajectory with him than, you know, shows up at first blush. Then I wanted to float another undrafted free agent to you. This has been a guy who has appealed to me because he's tiny. And I do like some of the small guys. He's tiny, but extremely fast. And when you look at the Ravens and the Ravens have a lot of structural problems, they went from an offense that was a downhill rushing offense, created extreme value for the running backs. And then a vertical passing offense where you get Rashad Bateman behind the defense, you get Marquise Brown behind the defense, you get Mark Andrews down the seam to one where now all we really get is a flurry of targets to Zay Flowers behind the line of scrimmage. So I don't know that there's value in this offense, but Keaton Mitchell, undrafted free agent out of East Carolina. Huge total rushing numbers last season in college. As a guy who was barely sub 180. So you're talking about, you know, in the, the HN size range. So playable in the right situation if you're explosively athletic. But this is a guy who, again, and it's going to be against a lower level of competition, but the only major prospect who had a better evasion rate in college last year was B. John Robinson. Okay. 437 speed, elite bell cow production, plus elite peripherals, made the Ravens out of camp, was put on IR basically instantly. He took a big hit after a long run in a preseason game with a shoulder injury. I have no idea kind of where he is in his recovery or what the situation would be with their intentions for him. But once you get into a situation where Melvin Gordon looks like your best back and he did look like their best back <laughs> on Sunday, then I think an undrafted free agent with plus speed becomes an interesting stash. And probably what they do is they have very minimal overall running back value as the season goes along. And then that value is very split. So that's the most likely scenario. But I do think there are some you know, long shot possibilities that a Justice Hill or a Melvin Gordon or maybe even a Keaton Mitchell would emerge there. And then the final one I would just throw out with the Cleveland Browns. And Jerome Ford struggled this past week. I, I mean, the Cleveland Browns are not blocking for their running backs the way they have previously. Ford is able to get two touchdowns. And so you end up obviously with a good fantasy week, but it's yet another game where I mean, his average contact point in week three was in the backfield, right? So you have to be really good as a running back to make something out of that. Kareem Hunt immediately jumps Pierre Strong for snaps, but then also he comes out of the game with a couple of injuries. I don't know how significant they are. We'll have to look for practice reports today and tomorrow. But I just want to remind people that when you see what the Dolphins did last week, when you see what DeAndre Swift did, and you're thinking, how can I get some exposure to plays that might have some similarities? Pierre Strong is a guy who was a workhorse in college, 43740, 94th percentile freak score. If you're looking for an undervalued, basically free athlete who has been a good running back, right? It's not somebody who couldn't play in college and yet is still kept around because he's an athlete. Someone with big time numbers in the past and big time athleticism, Pierre Strong is your guy. That I think is a great way to finish it. I have a team, Sean. We've talked a little bit about it. It's not going to hold on or anything, but it's an 81st overall in the best ball mania regular season leaderboard right now. Kind of cool to have a team in the top 100 through three weeks. It's a Tua, Mostert, Tyreek Hill team. It's got Herbert as well. I went with two elite quarterbacks in this one. Um, been a couple of our stealing bananas underdog teams are doing very well. 
Nice. Nice. Got some Dolphins have exposure. To, that Dolphins exposure is good. It's great. You'll have to send me those rosters. I want to see those. Obviously, those are on your account. But my team uh, has Pierre Strong stashed. At, it was the, the final round pick. And so, you know, it also has Quentin Johnston with the, the Mike Williams injury. And it also has Gus Edwards with the J.K. Dobbins injury. I grabbed him as a bring back on the Miami with the Week 17 correlation stuff. So it's actually a team that has done really well and not gotten points from those three players that have all benefited from major injuries to teammates. Uh, their outlooks have, have benefited. And so anyway, you you talking up Pierre Strong, certainly have a good good team that would would prefer to, to see that be very accurate. The other name you mentioned, for anyone who wasn't sure, Keaton Mitchell, they're like, hey, I've never heard that name. I, I want to confess, and this doesn't happen often. I said to you, Sean, when you brought him up to me, earlier uh i don't recall hearing that name <laughs> he's a rookie from this year a, an undrafted free agent uh you know one of those names that people who do more prospect work would remember but for me i literally was like i don't think i've ever heard that name before if i had it's it was in one year not the other i'm sure some of our listeners felt the same way it was been a fun show sean we went extra long today but a lot of great stuff, a lot of uh, good thoughts in, as we see how things are going to evolve here the rest of the way. And the number one thing we know is that they're going to be constant change or at least a lot more. Have a lot of guys who have hit, some guys who have missed, some guys we weren't on who have hit. All of those will be interesting to track, but also working through the logic of where teams and individual players are and what is most likely to happen I think that that's a lot of fun. I enjoyed this exercise with you a lot. And that'll do it for today's episode of Steeling News. I'm Sean Siegel. With me as always is Ben Gretsch. Make sure you're following him at Yards Per Gretsch. Make sure you're signed up for Stealing Signals. Make sure you're signed up for Stealing Lines, his betting project with Dalton Cates. Make sure you're signed up for Stealing Signals Gold, the YouTube interaction program you're doing with a special tier of subscribers. Is that, is that the right way to describe it? Yeah. Yeah. And Stealing Signals yeah. Gold has been, has been fun, right? You're... It's been really fun, yeah. It's been a little Q&A section with uh, with those subscribers every Tuesday night about the stuff that I wrote about Stealing Signals. Um, we've crystallized some some really good stuff and some good thoughts uh, over the first couple of weeks. I've had a blast doing it. It's been great. That's awesome. Make sure you're signed up for that. We'd love to have you with us over at Rotoviz. The coupon code, as always, is RVRADIO2023. Check Check out for 10% off your one-year subscription. Leave us a rating review. That helps us so much with the algorithm. We love you guys. Good luck tonight on Thursday Night Football. Good luck in week four. We'll talk to you soon.